we could switch to a we'll switch to a piece of paper. I can make this this work. <clears throat> I think it works, right? You can see my piece of paper. Uh, so I'm going to start with recalling some very basic and classical things, uh, starting with the with the uh, Poincaré recurrence theorem, and then I'm going to go up to more modern things and some recent results. So let me just recall what Poincaré is about, the Poincaré recurrence theorem. So this is actually a theorem which is stated by Poincaré, but it was proved by Cara Theodori in uh, 1919, so a little bit more than 100 years ago. And um, you can state it in different ways. One way of stating it is that if you have a metric space, which is separable, so separable metric space, And then we have some dynamical system, some transformation, which is acting on this space. Uh, and we have a new invariant probability measure, uh, a T invariant probability measure mu. It's not important that it's a probability measure, but it should be a finite measure at least. <clears throat> and then the result is that then, then for um, mu almost every point X, we have that, if we look at the distance between a point and its nth iterate, then the lim inf of this thing goes to um, uh, is zero. So the distance becomes as small as you like if you if you just iterate of times. And, um, this of course doesn't have to be true for all x, but for mu almost x. Another way of saying this alternatively. is that you can say that for almost all points X, there exists some sequence Rn, some distances which depend on the point and they go to zero such that, uh, such that uh, if I take the kth iterate of the point X, then it belongs to a ball of radius Rk of X, which center X for, infinitely many k. Uh, so what this talk will be about to a large extent is about what kind of sequences can we, can we take so that this property here holds for almost all points x. Uh, so from 1919 up to more modern times, there was not much improvement on this, but there is another result, which I guess you could call classical, is by Bonchon It's from 1993. Um, and so he assumes a little bit more. Um, so if the, um, if we look at the alpha dimensional Hausdorff measure, and if this is sigma finite, On, on this separable metric space X, uh, then for almost every X, this limb in, you can improve it by putting a certain number in front of this distance, namely, um, namely, uh, let me see here. Did I write this correct? Uh, Yes, I did. Um, so this limit without n to the power one over alpha, according to Poincaré, the limit of this is zero, but now we can put in something increasing here, something which goes to infinity, and then the limit will, if not be zero, it will at least be finite for mu almost all x. Uh, so another way of saying this, if you want to put it in, in the words, which is here, you can say that, so alternatively, you can say that the kth iterate of the point X 
belongs to a ball around X with radius some constant divided by N to the one over alpha for infinitely many case. Uh, N should be K here. So this is Pochanissa's result and you can actually improve it a little bit more even that if this um, measure it's not only sigma finite, but if it's actually finite, then you can even, even say that this limit is, is uh, uh, not only finite, but it's equal to zero. But let us not dig into the details of the statement there. Uh, any questions so far? Please go ahead and interrupt as much as possible. Uh, so let's go into more Polish results. There's a, there's a rather recent result by uh, Łukasz Pawlitz from, or at least published 2017. Uh, and he improved this a little bit. Uh, he approved that you have some expanding systems. So he assumed a little bit more about the, the dynamical system. Here it's completely general, except for this thing with the Hausdorff measure. Uh, so he, he has assumed that he had some expanding map on some manifold and that there was some uh, some mi mixing rates known. <clears throat> I will not state the exact assumptions, but he improved this thing to the following. Uh, he could put in a not only n to this power, but n log log n to the power one over alpha, and then this distance between x and t and x. So this limit is actually equal to zero in, uh, in this somewhat more restrictive setting. Uh, so the question okay. is then, I mean- how I have a question. In Very this restricted, restricted setting in particular, x is compact in the pavelets. Uh, right? Yes, I think so, yes. Uh, because I don't remember the exact definitions, but yes, I believe it's a, it's a complex. Uh, because I believe that if in Boschernitzan's theorem we assume the X is uh, um, compact, yes, then we immediately get the zero. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not quite sure because it really has to do with the uh, with the host of measure if it's sigma finite or finite and so on. I think he doesn't have any statement with the um, compactness here, as far as I can remember. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm just saying that X and T and X, they have bounded distance. And yes. then you have an increasing N. So if- Yeah, so you have something which is bounded times something which goes to infinity. So this could uh, very much be that the limit is infinite. Ah. So, so what it really says is that if I take this distance, then uh, for infinitely many cases, it's, it's at most a constant over k to some power, some positive power. Okay, okay. So, so they do come very close in, in this sense, uh, infinitely many times. Okay, <clears throat> more questions? So let me then state some even more exact results. So what would be nice to, to have is some results which says, when do you, for which, which radius RK, if we go back to here, for, for which do you have this infinitely often and for which do you not have it? It would be nice to have a, an exact description of for which you have it and for which you don't have it. So either there's infinitely many cases for which this happens, or there are only finitely many, and it would be nice to have a condition which states when you have infinitely many and when you have finitely many. And such a condition actually exists. Uh, there is a result by, which is actually uh, just appeared in ergodic theory for like a week or two ago, I think. Uh, it's a paper by Hussein, uh, Lee, Simmons and one. So it came out this year. 
uh, but I think the preprint on archive is from 2020. Uh, so they have results for various systems. So they assume uh, a lot about the structure of the systems and um, I will not state the most general uh, case of it, but let's restrict to piecewise expanding maps because that's what I will be interested in, in later, at least interval maps. So they are looking at piecewise expanding maps on, on an interval, say the interval from zero to one, just to fix things. And they have an invariant measure, which is equivalent to Lebesgue measure. So such systems exist, this is well known. And for these systems, they prove the following thing. The theorem is that we have TK of X belonging to a ball of radius RK for infinitely many K. This holds if and only if the sum of these radii diverges. So if the sum of the radii converges, then you have this for only or for at most finitely many case. So here is really a completely full description of when it happens that you have this infinitely many returns to a small ball and when you don't. Uh, and at about the same time, there is a, <clears throat> another result by, by some co-authors of mine and myself. And uh, the result is, is more general so, because it assumes less about the systems, but the result is, is less strong. So this is for almost all X? Yeah, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, for infinitely many, then for... Almost every X, yes, of course. Almost every X, because otherwise you cannot have anything like this. Uh, so it's a paper by Kirseboom and Kunde and myself. So it's on archive, uh, it's from 2021. It has been accepted, but not appeared yet. Uh, and we are looking at interval maps. So we have some system on an interval, <clears throat> but we don't assume anything about the structure of the, of the map. So we don't assume anything about that it's piecewise expanding or something like that, but we assume that we have exponential decay of correlation. In this result, do we assume some kind of ergodicity? Yeah, you could think of it uh, like that if you like, but it doesn't follow from ergodicity in, uh, immediately. No, I mean, the ergodicity is necessary for this kind of things. Yes, uh, exactly. So here, well, no, it's not really necessary for these kind of things. Uh, Otherwise, I don't know what is almost every, almost every, not with respect to the back. Well, it is respect to, to the measure mu. Uh, so here, I think actually, I don't remember exactly their definition, but let's assume that is, uh, it's even mixing here. Uh, but, uh, but if we go back a little bit to, for instance, Boshanitsan's result, <clears throat> um, there, there is no assumption on the invariant measure here. And the thing is that, I mean, if, if the measure is not uh, ergodic, you could just restrict to an ergodic component. Uh, and it wouldn't really change the setting anything, right? It just makes the space smaller. So if it's sigma finite, then I mean, it will still be sigma finite if you restrict to a smaller subset. Um, so this thing with the recurrence is not so so important for the um, um, <clears throat> the ergodicity, but uh, but uh, you can just restrict to an ergodic component, and uh, I will even assume that that this. This measure is mixing in a, in a very strong way. Um, <clears throat> so we assume that we have exponential decay of correlation. For bounded variation against L1, let me state what this means. It means that if I have two functions, f and j, and I multiply them, compose one of them with the dynamical system, and I integrate with respect to the measure. 
um, and then remove the <clears throat> leverages of these meshes. Uh, then this is less or equal to some constant times the, the uh, L1 norm of F and the bounded variation norm of J. And then times something which goes to zero, let's say minus tor N or tor is some positive number. <clears throat> and this is something which is known that it holds for piecewise expanding maps, but it also holds for some quadratic maps, for instance, and, uh, and other settings. So, so there are plenty of examples of, of systems which has this decay of correlations. Um, we also need us to assume something about uh, mesh mu more than this. We assume something that, uh, that the measure of, of, of a ball of say radius r, this should be, well, I don't have the absolute value there should be less or equal to uh, some constant times r to some power s. And c and s are positive numbers, but do not depend on the point x. So it, this is a rather mild assumption on the measure, which often holds, for instance, for Gibbs measures and, and things alike. Uh, so in this setting, we get something which is very similar to, to, uh, to this, but not quite a dichotomy in this case. We are able to prove that if, and this is the simple case, that if, let me write something more first. So the thing is that to get the good result here, which I will come back to later when I'm starting to talk about the proofs is that one should really not look at a fixed radius here, but one should look at the fixed uh, measure. So I should, choose a sequence RK, which depends on X in such a way that the ball around X with this radius should have a certain fixed number MK of the measure. So the measure depends only on K, not on the point X. <clears throat> uh, and in this case, the, the result is the following, that if this thing is summable, then for almost all points, I don't write this out, but I say it for almost all points X, you have the, the kth iterate belongs to this ball. For finitely many K. And it would be desirable to say that if this sum diverges, then you have it for infinitely many K, but we can only prove it for a slightly, slightly um, uh, weaker statement. If the following, if I sum from n to n and k, if this goes to infinity when n goes to infinity, which is stronger than saying that just the sum of the mk is infinite, then I have it for infinitely many k. So the difference here between <clears throat> our result and the, the previous is that we are able to treat much more general measures. They don't have to be absolutely continuous with respect to the bag measure, but on the other hand, we get, we get uh, not quite a dichotomy here. And um, they were also able to treat more general systems. So this is the, the results up to date uh, that I'm not going to go into in much more detail than this, but one can ask the question if it's possible to refine this even further. <clears throat> uh, and in order to describe this, I would like to, to say a little bit about dynamical Borel Cantelli lemmas. So if we have a, let me just write this dynamical. So here I have a fixed point Y. So Y is fixed. 
and I have some radius RK, which goes to zero. And then we can ask the question, does TK of X belongs to a ball with center Y and radius RK or infinitely many K? So this is similar to what I talked about up to now, but I don't have X here. The center of this ball is a fixed point Y and not the point that I'm iterating. So it's a very closely related question, but it's different. Uh, <clears throat> and what is easy to prove, this is just by the standard borel cantelli lemma, is that if, this is easy, is that if the sum of the measures of these balls Then this assume, uh, implies that for almost all point X, the iterate belongs to this ball for at most finitely many X. The finitely many K for almost every X. <clears throat> And in many settings, you can say that if this sum diverges, then, <coughs> then uh, TK of X belongs to this ball for infinitely many Ks, for almost all X. Uh, and this is what is usually called dynamical Borel Cantelli lemmas, but sometimes you can even prove something stronger. You can prove the following. Uh, so for instance, there are many different versions of this, but for instance, just to cite one thing, there is a paper by Kim, Dong Han Kim from 2007, where he looking, he's looking at interval maps. With exponential decay of correlation. So more or less exactly the same kind of systems which which I talked about here. And for those systems, <clears throat> um, you can prove actually more. You can prove that if this sum of the measures of the balls diverges, then this implies the following, that for almost every point X, If I look at the following quotient, so what I can do is that I can sum k goes from one to n of, of um, uh, I take the indicator function on these balls and I plug in tkx. So I, what I'm doing is that I'm counting how many times does tk of x belong to this ball between time one and time n. And then I'm averaging with respect to the measure of these balls from one to N. And this limit is, is equal to one for almost all points X. So not only can I say that if this, if this, uh, the sum of this measures goes to infinity, <clears throat> Then not only can I say that they have infinitely many x, uh, infinitely many k's for which tkx belongs to the ball, but I can also say approximately how many, how many they are up to time n. So it would be natural to ask if you can do the same kind of things in the setting when y is not a fixed point, but instead you have, have an x there as well. We can ask this question: What about what about something like uh, taking the sum from one to n of uh, x r k and yeah, looking at the measure of this ball. Can you say something about that, that this should go to one? <clears throat> so this is something which is, a, is, which is then a natural extension to these previous theorems, which I mentioned here. 
but it doesn't follow from them immediately. It's, uh, it's, it's a stronger statement. Uh, and this you can do actually. So and this is a recent preprint by myself from the beginning of this year. Uh, which is an archive, um, but you need to assume some, some things, of course. So you need some assumptions and the setting is the following. <clears throat> so I have a dynamical system, which is an interval map, for instance, the interval from zero to one. Uh, I have a measure mu, which is invariant probability measure. And I have exponential decay, Correlations. For bounded variation and L1 functions. <clears throat> so just like in this previous, previous theorem. And um, the measure of balls should be controlled in some way. So it should be less than some constant R to the power S. And um, <clears throat> So what I'm looking at here is that I'm looking at the sequence MK, which is the measure of the ball around X with size RK of X. And I'm assuming that I have a sequence RK of X, which depends on X <clears throat> and such that, that this measure is constant MK. And I need to assume the following. So you can think of it like mk is given and then rk of x is defined in this way. And I assume that mk satisfies the following. <clears throat> so it should not be too small. I have to assume that it's a little bit bigger than one over k, namely log k to the power of four plus some positive number epsilon. It could be any positive epsilon. And I assume, I also have to assume that it um, decays in a some kind of regular way. Um, so I will write down the assumption, but it's, you can disregard it. It's just a technical assumption to make the proof works. Uh, it looks a bit ugly perhaps, but it basically just says that it decays with some kind of uniform speed. Uh, I'm looking at MK and m k times some number rho, take the integer part of this thing. Uh, and if k is large and rho, even if rho is close to one, this limit should be equal to one. So for instance, if mk is equal to, to this thing, then this thing is satisfied. So, so if you want, if you, you can think of it as having an inequality up here. Uh, so under this assumption, We do have that the limit as n goes to infinity of, of this uh, count the number of times that, that the iterate hits the ball from time one to n. And I divide by the measure of these balls, which is just mk. And this limit is equal to one for almost every point X. So this is what you could call a corresponding result to, to this thing from borel cantelli lemmas. This is called a strong borel cantelli lemma. You could say that this is a kind of strong borel cantelli lemma for recurrence. <clears throat> I'm going to explain a little bit about how these things are proved. Uh, let me also just mention that, uh, that uh, there is a corollary, an immediate corollary of this, which is the following, that if you look at the hitting time to a set B or ball, for instance, 
of a point X. This is defined as the minimum time you need to iterate in order to have that the point lands in this set B. So B could be a ball usually, but in principle, it could be any set. And <clears throat> what you can use this result for is that we can prove that for almost every X, if I take the limit as R goes to infinity, uh, to zero, the logarithm of, of uh, the hitting time to a ball of size R around X for the point X itself. This is essentially equal to minus the logarithm of the measure of this ball. So this limit is equal to one. Um, so this is a new result, but it's, it was known previously if, if I have a fixed center of these balls. So I'm looking at points hitting a fixed target rather than returning to themselves. So this is rather, rather direct to prove it from the uh, from this counting result. Okay, any <clears throat> questions so far? I have one question. Yes. Uh, this point X uh, is it? Uh, can it? So you don't know if you can choose the critical points as X. No, I only know that for almost all points X, this yeah. um, okay. this is the case. There's so, for point. instance, if I have the quadratic uh, family, yeah. then for a positive measure of parameters, it fits into this picture. So, yeah. But uh, for this, so I fix one of those parameters, and then I can only say that for almost all points that I'm iterating, I have this uh, this property. But I cannot say anything about a particular point. All right. Okay. And this is what is often the well. I can say things about particular points. I can say things about periodic points, for instance. But that's kind of trivial things. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So let's see. <clears throat> well, let me have it lying there a little bit still. Anything else? So I'm just going to give an overview of how to prove this and what what the difficulties are. Uh, and um, So the, the short story is that there are kind of standard methods to prove these things, uh, but I couldn't make them work for this particular theorem. So I had to kind of tweak them with some tricks, which I found uh, rather interesting, but let's see. So let's just see what, what, how, how would be the, the, the standard way to try to attack this problem. So the standard way would be to kind of look at the following set. I call it EK, but you can call it whatever you like if you want to call it something else. So these are the points X such that TK of X belongs to this ball of radius RK. Uh, so I look at the set of points where I have a close recurrence at time k. So what I want to analyze is that I want to analyze this sum here, which is in the nominator of this fraction. And this sum is actually, I can write it with, uh, with help of this set ek. I can write it just as the sum of the indicator on ek of x. It certainly shortens the notation a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's useful to have this notation in any case. <clears throat> so what we want to prove is that we want to prove the following. We want to prove that if I look at this quotient, which is in the theorem, divided by the sum of this uh... well let me let me actually say that 
let's say that we want to prove this instead. This is exactly, this is not quite what's in the theorem. But if you look at this from a probabilistic view, is that, that um, what would you expect this sum to be? Well, you would expect that this sum would be something like the average of the sum and the average is exactly this thing. Uh, so I would expect that, and I would, let's say we want to prove that this thing, this quotient, and then I remove one, that this thing goes to zero almost everywhere. And I also would like to prove, and this is actually not difficult, I would like to prove that the measure of this set EK, this is approximately equal to this number MK. This is rather easy to prove. So <clears throat> if I can prove this, then I have the theorem essentially. So how do you prove this? Well, you consider the following. Let me change to the right side of the paper. The standard method to do this is that you, you look at the square of this thing. You would consider the integral of the square. So I take the integral of, of this thing. Uh, So it's sum from one to n. And then I kind of try to estimate what this is. Let me call it capital MK or something. <clears throat> and just assume that for instance, we are able to prove that the sum of these MKs converges. What does it mean? Well, then it means you can think of this as as uh, squares of L2 norms. So what it does is that it proves that, that the sum of these uh, functions will converge in L2 norms. So then therefore they must converge in the, the sequence of these functions that I'm integrating must converge almost everywhere. In particular, they must converge to zero almost everywhere because otherwise the sum wouldn't converge to, to something. So if I can prove something like this, then I actually have the result. I don't know if we call it star or something. <clears throat> and then there are actually things, there are some lemmas which helps you actually doing this, which says that, well, you can go with less than this section. So there is a lemma by, well, it's called, uh, sometimes it's called Gal Coxma. Uh, Sometimes it's called Sprintzug's lemma, and it's yeah, it goes under different names in different places, uh, and it's also called Schmidt sometimes, Wolfgang Schmidt, and so on. <clears throat> but essentially, it gives you a slightly weaker condition, and they're saying that this should be be uh, summable to to conclude the star. Uh, so what you need to do is that you need to control this integrals in any case. You need to estimate them. And if you can get good estimates, then you can get your results. So let me just write out a little bit. If I, if I expand this um, parenthesis and integrate, what I get is that I get that this M, but it's not MK, it's MN, right? Is mn is equal to one over the sum of these measures squared. And then I have some, let's say k and l goes from one to infinity, uh, not infinity, to n. And I have <clears throat> the measure of these sets ek intersected with el minus the product of these measures. This is like the correlation of these sets. So I want to prove that this MN is small. If I can prove that it's small enough, then I can get the result. So without going into the details in the proof here, let me just say that, that uh, we need to prove that this is small enough in some sense. And, uh, and this is like the difficulties in the proof. 
So how do you estimate these things? You need to estimate the correlations of this thing. You also actually have, have to estimate the measures of the EK sets. This is what is here. So there are some estimates which comes into play here, and this is done by decay of correlation. K of correlation. <clears throat> uh, and it actually turns out, at least when I tried to do it, that I couldn't do it in this way because the estimates I, I had for these things, they were not good enough. So it could be that I'm not good enough to make these estimates and therefore I don't get good enough estimates, but it could also be that there is some difficulty here, which is really there. Um, so what I'm doing here actually in the, in the proof of the theorem is that I'm using this, this paper by, by myself and Jose Bowman Kunde. There we also had estimates of this type. So I actually already had some estimates here, which I could reuse, but they were not good enough. But then I managed to get around this with some tricks and the tricks are the following. So, so the, the above doesn't work. Well, at least for me. And Well, one of the reasons it doesn't work is that, okay, I have this sum that I want to estimate and the average of this sum is approximately then, uh, or it's actually equal to the, the, the sum of the, some of these measures, but I don't know what these measures are really. I know that asymptotically for large K, these things are kind of comparable. They are very close. But this gives actually some, in the, in the estimates here, it gives, uh, gives a bit of complications. Uh, and one way to overcome this difficulty is to do the following, that instead I consider the following. So I consider, I call it SN of X. This is the sum from one to N of I divide by the measure of this set EK. I don't really know exactly what this is, this measure, but I don't care. Uh, it will be positive at least in this measure. And then I take this uh, indicator function on the set EK of X. So it's the same sum as I had before, but instead of just looking at this sum, I have normalized each of the terms. So instead of normalizing the entire sum, but this, by the sum of these measures, I do it term-wise instead. And this has the following effect that we have that if I look at the average of this SN, this is equal to, not approximately, it's really equal to N because the average of each term is EK, the measure of EK and I normalize by each, uh, the measure. So <clears throat> the average of each term is one and I have N terms. <coughs> and then what I do is that I prove that for almost every point X, if I look at the average of, of, uh, of the sum, Average with which I mean I take one over n, um, so not average with respect back to mu, but just by dividing one by n, I prove that this goes to to one as n goes to infinity. Uh, so how do do you prove this? Well, you can actually prove this. <coughs> sorry, by doing something similar here, you can prove a version of this gal Coxma lemma, Sprintzuk's lemma, which fits into this setting. So you cannot use this lemma immediately. You have to prove a new version because the assumptions are not satisfied, but 
in more or less exactly the same way, you can prove a corresponding lemma which fits into this section. And by some magical thing, if I do like this, then the estimates I have on these correlations, they are suddenly enough. So by doing this <clears throat> other way, I have enough information to prove this thing. Now, the problem is only that this is not what I wanted to prove because I wanted to prove something else. I didn't want to prove that this goes to one. I wanted to prove that, I wanted to prove that um, this thing here goes to one, which is not the same. But then you can actually prove, and this is just some kind of calculus lemma that after that you prove that you prove that this actually implies um, that what you want actually holds. Uh, so you can prove that this implies that this thing goes to one for almost all point x. So once you have this, <clears throat> You can prove this. Uh, and then you just prove that this mu of ek is comparable to, uh, to uh, mk. And then you have the result. So, <clears throat> and this last step actually, you can only prove this if you have uh, some control on how the measures are behaving. And uh, if I go back to the statement of the, of the, of the result, which I have here. So to enable to, in order to prove that you can go from there to there, you need some, some of these assumptions, for instance, that it uh, is this MK uh, behaves in a nice way, for instance, this strange assumption. Uh, so with this trick, you can get the result. You have to impose a little bit more conditions, but they are not too strong. So, so it's not that bad. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and this is basically the, the, the proof without going into all details. Uh, let me maybe just mention one more detail is that <clears throat> It's here that you really, you, you, you're, you're looking at this correlation. You want to say that the measure of EK and EL is approximately equal to the product of the measures. <clears throat> and here you really need that, um, you need that, um, that this thing, which I called RK of X, depends on X. Let me recall that EK is equal to the set of points X such that TK of X belongs to the ball uh, of radius RK around X and that RK of X depends on X. If I don't, make RK of X depend on X, and I make it depend on X such that this ball always have the same measure, no matter what, what X is. If I just take RK of X being a constant, then it turns actually out that they don't have this asymptotic uh, behavior that they are uh, essentially independent. Uh, <clears throat> So, th so this is an important step in actually getting getting good estimates in this uh, in this setting. Um, and the reason for this is that you can basically prove that e k is approximately equal to the integral of the measure of the ball and uh, you can prove that uh, not e k the measure of e k is like this. And you can prove that the measure of EK intersected with EL 
And this is, of course, if K is large, and this thing is if it's K and L are large and also far apart. We can prove that this is approximately equal to the average of the product of these measures. Or L of X. And <clears throat> if you think of this for a while, if if, if I choose now the, the RK of X and RL of X so that this is actually constant, then of course I can bring these constants outside the integral. But, but if they are not constants, there is no reason that this thing should be like the product of two of these things up here. So this kind of pinpoints why, why you need to, to have this RK depending on X in a particular way in order to get good results. Uh, but let me also stress that in some sense it's also natural because the the, the hitting it's basically depends basically behaves as some random thing and you would expect that the measure of the ball is the, is the thing which is which is necessary and important okay i think i will i don't know really what time it is but i think i will actually stop here nevertheless uh, yeah. Uh, could you say something uh, in order to understand, uh, you know, there are these assumptions you assume, right? Yes. And uh, let's say you don't assume or you assume some of them. Do you have some negative results that show you the, um, the limit of this result or of this method? Not really, no. I haven't really thought much about that. You could, of course, have something which is very slowly mixing and um, uh, and in that case, maybe you could... Uh, uh, yeah, for instance, if you have something which is slowly mixing, uh, you could probably make up something which, for which if we go back to... Um, go back to the beginning like I think this this uh, result which is like the best you could hope for that you have this dichotomy I think maybe you could if you have a very slowly mixing system you could probably find uh, counter examples to this in, in those in those settings mm -hmm. uh, but uh, otherwise there is the, the things which are needed here uh, that we are needing the K of correlation for this particular uh, particular function spaces is because there it's, it's easy to get good uh, good estimates. Uh, this thing here, <coughs> well, this is also uh, just because this is also needed in order to estimate the the measure of these sets that I called EK. Um, so it's all it's all about how to to be able to make the estimates at all actually. But uh, they, they, some of them are definitely needed, uh, but certainly not all of them. Are there other questions? Or? Let me ask, what are corollaries for continued fractions? Ah, for continued fractions, yeah. Uh, have infinitely many branches for Gauss map. And... Yeah, so so you can apply this thing for the Gauss map, but uh, <clears throat> for the Gauss map, so uh, the Gauss map, it satisfies the assumptions. When the measure is the usual Gauss measure, uh, but for the Gauss map, if you want to talk about continued fractions, what is interesting is rather like how, so here is the, the system, it looks something like this, right? I'm not going to draw all the branches because there are infinitely many, it can take a long time to draw them. Uh, but if, you want, if you're interested, to, uh, interested in continued fraction digits, then you're interested in how a general point comes close to the fixed point zero. Mm. Uh, and what I'm looking at is that the point X comes close to itself. And uh, of course, <coughs> sorry, you can translate this into some kind of periodicity or 
not really periodicity, but some kind of approximate periodicity of the of the continued fraction digits, I guess. Uh, I haven't done so, but uh, it sounds straightforward. I'm not sure it's very interesting, but uh, you could you could use it to say something like that the same pattern repeats again and again so and so often for a typical point, I guess. So your methods can only work for uh, return maps, not for ap approximation uh, statistics? Sorry, I didn't quite hear. Uh, I mean, uh, you say that uh, you make results about returning to the starting points. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, those results cannot be applied to uh, the statistics of approaching of some other point. Uh, so you start from the point X and you ask how often you are visiting some small neighborhood of a point Y. Yeah, so I mean, these are, of course, related questions, but uh, and the proofs are about similar, but it's not, uh, if you have one result for one of them, it doesn't immediately it apply results for the other one. Uh, so you would expect in general that, that the behavior are the same for these kind of things, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Rather, yes. I cannot think at the moment of the results when the two kinds of questions were completely different. No, no, of course. I mean, in some sense, I mean, you prove them with the same way, so in the same way. So, so uh, if you can prove one, you can you can uh, prove the other one. <laughs> well, but I, I think uh... I remember at any situation when one of those results you can prove and another of those results you can prove and they are different. Yeah, no, no, I, I certainly agree. So, so uh, and, and I think you're right, but, but there is no result saying that if you have one, you have the other one. But isn't the ergodicity here is key, right? Because that's the whole point with recurrence. Recurrence holds without assuming... Uh, yes, that's true. Whereas, whereas if I have two components that are, uh, let's say, they, are, they have some distance between them, I wouldn't go from the one to the other, right? No, sure. No, but, but if, we, if we restrict to ergodic systems or even mixing ones, then what Michal will say is it's, uh, it's definitely true that uh, you cannot think of a, of a system, well, you could think of it maybe, but you cannot give an example of a system where you have one of the results, but not the other one, or you yeah. have both results, but they are kind of different. Um, in, some, in some cases, actually, you can actually, what you can do is actually you can prove a more general uh, general result. There's actually, I was listening to a talk the other day, actually Friday last week. Uh, maybe some of you would also listen to it by, uh, I think he's called Ya Shang or something like that. Maybe I misspelled the name, but something like that. And what he, he looked at a slightly more <coughs> general question that you, you have some function f of x, which maps, so f is, is uh, you don't look at this as a dynamical system, but just some kind of transformation of the space. And then you're iterating the uh, dynamical system and you're looking at this thing. And what, what can you say? Can you say something? You want, want this to be less than Rn for infinitely many, many n. And there are two natural things is that if f of x is, is equal to x, then of course you get this recurrence question. Uh, and if, so this leads to recurrence. And if f of x is equal to, to y for all x, then you have hitting. And what he does for some kind of systems, he proves like one result for, for every setting of, of this type where f is Lipschitz. So this, in some sense, it answers Michal's question, saying that in at least some cases, you can prove both of them at the same time. But there is no theorem saying that one of them implies the other. So, so they are definitely related. You prove them in the same way. And, uh, but I mean, in principle, you could, well, maybe you can't, but but you could in principle think of that there is maybe some cases where they behave differently, but, but probably no natural examples. So this is of course for some mixing systems. 
in particular algorithms. Someone is knocking. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess, are there any other questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> okay. So, um, as you know, we Usually our seminar uh, is a little bit longer. Yes, I know. <laughs> but I don't want to tire you uh, uh, too much for the, with the Zoom talks because they're a little bit more tiring than real talks, I find. Uh, I, I must tell you, I found the, this technique where your hand is moving. Uh, because you know, at least yeah. in my computer, it was not. Um, it was like a slide.